from the neighborhood to the night. But she tries. Sugar Frosted Flake cereal. I bought the tires, sir. Quick. You're about to enter a place. A vault, if you will. An archive made of machinations of the human mind. In this, a flashback. A flashback of a farmhand's nephew and his uncle. Going by the names of Jim and Frazier, the story begins with something seemingly innocent, and then the unknown will make things go askew. Welcome to the Archives. I had lived with my Uncle Jim for most of my life. Abandoned by my parents at a young age, unwanted and alone. Uncle Jim was the closest thing to a father figure I'd ever had. We lived a cozy little existence out there on that farm. It was quiet and peaceful, as, aside from the everyday ramblings of our livestock, cows, pigs, and goats. And not to mention a large coop of hens with the cockiest of roosters. There was also a farm cat or two wandering about, but seeing them was a rare occurrence as they liked to catch their mouses under the shadow of night. Yep, things were pretty typical, that is, until the 8th of July, 2008. July 6th. Uncle Jim would have his checklist in hand going over all our beasts, making sure no one decided to hop the fence in the middle of the night. Meanwhile... I'd be in the barn mucking stalls, spreading new hay, and keeping things orderly as best I could. Jim would still find something wrong with my chores no matter what I did, but I didn't mind so much. I owed him my livelihood, and having never had kids, Jim was doing his best to raise me by himself. I couldn't help but admire the guy. He was married to that life, cow pies and all. His only vice being the pack of Marlboro cigarettes he kept in his shirt pocket. I, on the other hand, did the work to appease him. I'd much rather stay the day indoors and catch up on current events on television. School was over until the fall, and I wanted to do my best to keep my brain whirring. Maybe if I had been more focused on the farm, I wouldn't have missed the threat that presented itself that day. After spending most of the morning and afternoon in the field, I started back for the house. Although it was small, the white paneling and green shutters made it stick out like a sore thumb on the horizon. But something else stood out that day. Jim, I asked. Don't you think that shirt's a little tacky? I mean, sure, it's summer, but I, I don't think that the birds can tell the difference. Standing smack dab in the middle of our lot was a scarecrow wearing a straw hat, sunglasses, and god-awful Hawaiian shirt. I'd known my uncle had briefly thought about purchasing one of those for the garden, since he was trying to hand his hand at more delicate vegetables this season, but this one seemed a little over the top and out of character. He told me that he wasn't the one who picked it out. He suspected it might have been from our neighbors, since we'd given them a deal in our early harvest of cobs. Aside from its sunny appearance, I thought nothing was off about it, so I gave it a once-over to size it up. I was considering replacing the shirt when I noticed something peeking out of its breast pocket. A piece of red paper, uh, a note. Scarecrows are not inanimate, it read. Really? I thought someone might have had to lock the guy down in order to get the clothes on. <laughs> Some sense of humor these uh, farm folk have. Thinking nothing of it, I passed it off to Jim and we had a good chuckle. The rest of the day went by as usual until the sun had fell and I found myself in my room. My night of relaxation was only slightly disturbed when there was some persistent knocking on the front door. It started soft and gentle but continually grew louder and quicker. I started to make my way towards it when the animal started raising a fuss. Uncle Jim was quicker than I to respond to this and he was already standing by the door. Wide open with another red note post in the middle of the wood. Let me in. It was written in a dark red looking, almost like blood. It smelled like it too. Jim told me to fetch his shotgun and to come with him to check on the animals. Lighting up one of his cigarettes as we passed through the door frame, I could tell Jim was a little shaken. Anyone would be, whether it was a prank or not, it certainly was spooky and out of place. 
But this was a man who toughed it out against some ordinary cows and pigs in his life. Yet his hand it was still twitching. The way his eyes kept darting all over should have made me suspect the danger was real. When we reached the livestock pens, the animals were still all a ruckus. All was noisy except for the coops. Instinctively, we decided to check there first. It was eerily quiet as we walked in sync between the fences. And we didn't even have to open the gates of the hen houses to see the damage. Total carnage would be putting it lightly. Chicken bodies were strewn all over. Stripped of their feathers and badly disfigured, I was terrified even before noting another bloody message written on the houses. We are coming. We were screwed. No chickens meant no eggs. Meant no eggs and bacon every breakfast. Meant less energy for the day. Not only that, but given this third offense, this third message, it was obvious our farms and our lives were being targeted. Uncle Jim had once told me, offering his off-the-kilter advice, to exact true vengeance on an opponent, do not mess with his valuables or his reputation, cut off his livelihood and lifestyle. To inflict pain is more than just a single action, it's a philosophical act of ingraining fear into a man. And that was what was beginning to happen here. More curious, though, was how quickly all the foul play had been done. It was not even ten minutes since the knocking began. Jim and I were exhausted after checking the rest of the animals. We dragged our feet back to the house. I tried sleeping, but my mind kept running wild with paranoid possibilities of our tormentor. Jim had a slightly easier time, I suspected, as he slept soundly, gun at the ready. We are coming. July 7th. Uncle Jim was still frazzled. He didn't even pick up his checklist for the day. I helped out as much as I could on top of my regular chores. I never wanted to have to deal with so many dead birds and feathers ever again. As Jim was worried about our food stock, he decided to go into town to resupply. But when he tried to start the engine of his busted old truck, it wouldn't start. After checking it out, he determined that it seemed like it was deliberately tampered with. The fuel line had torn or been cut. As I helped him put away his tools, he suggested that we make for the neighbors to give us a ride into town. I agreed, as our closest neighbors were, were kindly folk and not too far away. Twenty minutes if we cut along the paths in the field. Soon we were on said paths. As the sun started its afternoon descent, the worries of yesterday floated away for a moment, a serene break in the chaos. Jim lit up one of his trusty cigarettes as the neighbor's house grew into view. A lot like our own, small and white, but with a blue trim and in better condition. Its stillness made a chill go up my spine. I felt something was awry. As we approached the front of it, my suspicions were confirmed. The front door had been torn clean out of the frame, its shards all over the lawn. If only Jim had brought his gun instead of his smokes. Blood pooled in, front, in the front hall and trailed further into the house. Jim held back. We need to check this out. They're our friends, I insisted. And they were. Timothy and his aging mother Ellie were the kind of neighbors we all hoped for, friendly, kind, and, un and usually keep to themselves. Timothy was the only friend I had outside of school. I spent a lot of time in that house with him, playing games and complaining about the hard work. I could not and would not abandon him. I entered first, Jim close behind. Being careful not to step in the blood, we followed it to its end. A tragic end. A shocking, disturbing, and horrifying scene laid before us. I felt sick. While following the trail, I hadn't noticed more of the door shards strewn alongside in its slivers. It was as if someone wanted to make doubly sure we noticed a trail to follow. And where the trail had ended, it had exploded against the wall with two victims at its base, riddled with jagged wooden spikes sticking out in every direction. The only thing not coated with their blood was another message written above the corpses. We are here. Jim had bolted and I quickly followed suit. Like we ran all the way back to the safe illusion our home provided. I hid away in my room, out of breath and unable to think correctly. I blacked out after that. 
July 8th. 5 a.m. I awoke to the sounds of screams. I ran to the window to see absolute disaster framed by the glow of the rising sun. Monsters? I couldn't tell what they were exactly, but they had left a carnage in their wake. Behind them were bodies of our cattle, motionless and piled together. I broke my gaze away from the mess and run downstairs to the sound of the screaming. Uncle Jim. His silhouette stood in the frame of the doorway, his gun pointed outwards. As I reached the front entryway, he dropped his shotgun to the floor suddenly and was felled. A fatal puncture through the skull by a pitchfork. He was gone. The only person left in my life who I thought I could rely on. The monsters came into view. Flannel. Plaid. Tacky Hawaiian shirts. The painted smiles fading friendliness. The false promise of protection. I instantly remembered the first note. I, it hadn't been a joke. They were here to prove it. My name was Fraser. I lost my only friends and family to the scarecrows. My last memories of one of them growling, we are coming for everyone, as I was impaled by the same pitchfork that took my Uncle Jim away from me. I am gone. Scarecrows are not inanimate. Thank you. 